Well, boss, they suddenly done it to us again today. Look like it gettin' to be a habit on thizzier track. Thus, querulously, Jockey Mosby Jones, otherwise Little Mose, as he trudged dejectedly across the infield beside his employer, Old Man Curry, owner of Elisha, Elijah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and other horses bearing the names of major and minor prophets. Mose was still in his silks, there were reasons, principally Irish, why the little negro found it more comfortable to dress in the curry tack room and the patriarch of the jungle circuit wore the inevitable rusty frock coat and battered slouch hat. Side by side they made a queer picture, the small, bullet-headed negro in gay stable colors, and the tall, bearded scarecrow, the frayed skirts of his coat flapping at his knees as he walked. Ahead of them was Shanghai, the hostler, leading his steaming thoroughbred which had managed to finish outside the money in a race that his owner had expected him to win, expected it to the extent of several hundred dollars. Yes, Sue, it gettin' to be a habit, complained little Mose. Been so long since I rode into it ring I forget what it feels like to win a race. It's a habit we're going to break one of these days, Mose. What happened? Ha! Huh? A.S.T. me what didn't happen. Old Legia, he got off good, and first dash, wham. He gets bumped by a cheese nut has o dyers. I taken him back some and talk to him, and just when I'm sending him again, pow. Jock Merritt busts old Lee across he knows of his whip. In E stretch I tries to come T-H-O on inside, and two of M Irish jocks pulls over to E rail and puts us in a pocket. Nigga, they say to me, take that out hound home E long way, you suddenly never get in T-H-O. They was right, boss. Lee he come forth, sewed up like a eagle in a cage. Mm -hmm. And the judges didn't pay any attention when you claimed a foul? Little Mose gurgled wrathfully. Ha! Huh? I done claim three fouls. Judges, they say they didn't see no foul a at all. Didn't see us get bumped, didn't see Jock Merritt hit Leja, didn't see us pocketed. Course they didn't, they wasn't looking for no foul. On is track we not ony got to beat hosses, we got to beat jocks and judges too. How we go and lay up any bacon egg in such odds as that? It can't last, Mose, was the calm reply. There shall be no reward to the evil man, the candle of the wicked shall be put out. It burden mighty bright just now, boss. Solon, he say that? Old man Curry nodded, and little Moe sniffed skeptically. Aha! Solon he neve got gypped out of seven races in a row. Seven, eh? The old man counted on his fingers. Why, so it is, Moe's. This is the seventh time they've licked us, for a fact. Old man Curry began to chuckle, and the jockey eyed him curiously. You suddenly enjoy it mo when I do, boss, said he. That's because you don't read Solomon, replied the owner. Listen, a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Mose, we're due to rise up and smite these Philistines. Ha! Huh? Why not smite some M Irish boys first? You reckon M crooked judges can see us when we risen up? We'll have to fix it so's they can't overlook us, Mose. Ought to get em some eyeglasses then, was the sulky response. Seven and one, that's eight, Mose. We've got Solomon's word for it. Jockey Mosby Jones shook his head doubtfully. Mebso, boss, Mebso, but Thizier Solomon's been dead a low owing time now. He never got up egg in a syndicate betting ring and crooked judge in. He never rode no close finish if Irish jocks and haddish embarked on e fence. You can take Solmon's word for it, boss, but Lil Mosby, he's f a misery. He'll steal a fly and start next time out and try to stay so far in front that no Irish boy can reach him, if a lariat. A big, jovial-looking man, striding rapidly toward the stables, 
overtook them from the rear and announced his presence by slapping old man Curry resoundingly on the back. Tough luck, said he with a grin. Awful tough luck, but you can't win all the time, you know, old timer. Why, yes, said Curry quietly, that's a fact, Johnson. Nobody but a hog would want to win all the time. And I wish you wouldn't wallop me on the back that away. I most nigh swallowed my tobacco. Johnson laughed loudly. How do you like our track? he asked. Your track is all right, answered the old man, with just a shade of emphasis placed where it would do the most good. A visitor don't seem to do very well here, though, he added. The fortunes of war, chuckled Johnson. Ah, ha, said Curry. My boy here can tell you about that. He says the other jockeys fight him all the way round the track. Well, said Johnson, you know why that is, don't you? The boys ain't stuck on his color, and you can't blame em for that, Curry. If you had a boy like Walsh, now, it would be different. I'll bet it would, was the emphatic response of old man Curry. I think I can get Walsh for you. No, oh. Old man Curry dropped his hand on the Negro's shoulder. No. Mose has been writing for me quite some time now. He suits me first rate. You're the doctor, grinned Johnson. Do as you think best, of course. I'm only telling you how it is. Thank ye. I reckon I'll play the string out the way I started. Luck might change. Yes, it'll run bad for a while and then turn right round and get worse. So long. Johnson hurried on toward the stables, laughing loudly at his ancient jest, and old man Curry looked after him with a meditative squint in his eyes. As the crackling of thorns under a pot, he quoted soberly. A man that laughs all the time ain't likely to mean it, Mose, but I don't know so I would say that Johnson is exactly a fool. No, he's a pretty wise man, of his breed. He owns a control and interest in this track, under cover, of course, he's got a couple of books in the ring, and the judges are with him. I reckon from what he said about Walsh that he's in with the jockey syndicate. No wonder he wins races. Sure, he could get Walsh for me or any other crook-legged little burglar that would send word to Johnson what I was doing. Mose, yonder goes the man we've got to beat. Him too, boss? Little Mose rolled his eyes. Hosses, judges, jocks, and Johnson. Sutney is a tough card to beat. A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, repeated the old man, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. That's the rest of the verse, Mose. Boss, said the little negro earnestly, I don't wish nobody no hard luck, but if somebody got to fall, I hope one of them Irish jocks will fall in front and get jumped on by ten hosses. Don't make any mistake about it, Curry is wise. He may look like a Methodist preacher gone to seed, but the old scoundrel knows what's going on. He ain't a fool, take it from me. The speaker was Smiley Johnson, who was addressing a small but extremely select gathering of turf highwaymen who had met in his tackle room to discuss matters of importance. They were all men who would willingly accept two tens for a five or betray a friend for gain, Smiley Johnson, Billy Porter, Curly McManus, and Slats Wilson. All owned horses and ran them in and out of the money, as they pleased, and not one of them would have trusted the others as far as a bull may be thrown by the tail. We can trim the old reprobate, continued Johnson, but we can't keep him from finding out that the clippers are on him. And who cares if he does know, demanded Slats Wilson. I'm in favor of making it so raw that he'll take his horses and go somewhere else. Look at what he did last season. Got El Angle and a lot of other people ruled off, didn't he? Raised particular hell all over the circuit, the psalm-singing old hypocrite. He's got a fine, 
fat chance to get anybody ruled off around this track, interrupted Curly McManus. These judges ain't reformers. They know who's paying their salaries. Sure they do, assented Wilson, but the longer this old rip hangs on the more chance there is to get into a jam of some kind. He's a natural-born troublemaker. If he loses many more races the way he lost that one today, I wouldn't put it past him to go to the newspapers with a holler. That would hurt. I'm in favor of giving him the gate. When he hasn't won a race, argued Johnson. Use your head, slats. Let him run his horses, and bet on him. He may squawk, but he can't prove anything, and when he's lost enough dough he'll quit. Is there any way that we could frame up and get him ruled off? asked Porter. The ruling wouldn't stand, said Johnson. Curry has got too many friends higher up, and if we should try it and fall down it would give the track a black eye. The sucker horseman would be leery of us. If any framing is to be done, announced McManus, count me out now. You fellows know Grouchy O'Connor? Him and Engel framed on Curry till they were black in the face, and what did it get em? Not a nickel's worth. You've got to admit that Al Engel was smart as they make em, but O'Connor tells me that Curry made Al look like a selling plater, had him outguessed at every turn on the track. Let Curry run his horses, and our boys will take care of the little nigger. That Elisha is quite a horse, commented Johnson. If they take care of him, they'll go some. What's the use of worrying about Alicia? asked McManus. Curry hasn't started him yet at the meeting. He's trying to pick up some dough with Elijah and Isaiah and the others. They ain't so very much. Well, Elijah would have been right up there today if it hadn't been for a little timely interference now and then. Johnson grinned broadly as he spoke. A little timely interference, ejaculated Wilson. The boys did everything to that horse but knock him over the fence. And the judges didn't see a thing, chuckled Johnson. Say, let's get down to business, said Porter. What I want to know is this, Johnson, when are you going to cut loose with Zanzibar? You said we'd all be in with that, there'll be a sweet price on him, and we ought to clean up. Zanzibar is about ready, answered Johnson. You'll know in plenty of time, and he's a cinch. And nobody knows a thing about him, said McManus. Good reason why, laughed Porter. That's a pretty smart trick, working him away from the track. It's the only thing to do, said Johnson. Zanzibar is a nervous colt and if I worked him on the track with the other horses he'd go all to pieces. That's why I have Dutchie take him out on a country road and canter him. It keeps him from fretting before a race. How fast can he step the three quarters? asked Wilson. Fast enough to run shoes off of anything around here, said Johnson. You needn't worry about that. We won't have to put him up against the best, though. Zanzibar didn't do anything last season, and he's bound to get a price in almost any kind of a race. You're sure he's undercover? If he ain't undercover, a horse never was. He gets his work before sunrise, and at that most of it is just cantering. I've set him down, though, and I know what he can do. It sounds all right, admitted McManus. Where do we bet this money? demanded Porter. Johnson laughed. That's a fool question. The less he's played at the track the better. We'll unload in the pool rooms on the coast, same as we did before. Wilson here can enter Blitzen in the same race, and they can't get away from making Blitzen the favorite, on form they'd have to pick him to win easy. I'll let it leak out that I'm only sending Zanzibar for a workout and to see whether he's improved any over last season. The pool rooms won't know what hit M. 
Hold on, said McManus suddenly. Suppose Curry gets into the race. Bonehead, growled Wilson. You've got Curry on the brain. Outside of Alicia there's no class to his string of beetles, and Alicia is a distance horse. Three quarters is too short for him. He can't get going under half a mile, supplemented Porter. Well, apologized McManus, I like to figure all the angles. Old man Curry also liked to figure all the angles. He had the utmost confidence in Solomon's statement concerning the righteous man and the seven falls, but this did not keep him from taking the ordinary precautions when preparing for the eighth start and the promised rising up. He knew that the big raw-boned bay horse Elijah was a vastly improved animal, but he also desired to know the company in which Elijah would find himself the next time out. His investigations, while inconspicuous were thorough, and soon brought him in contact with the name of an equine stranger. Zanzibar, eh, thought the old man as he left the office of the racing secretary. Zanzibar? And Johnson owns him. Mm hmm. I'll have to find out about that one, sure. The others don't amount to much. But this Zanzibar? If I only had Frank now. Since the bull-faced kid's retirement from the turf the Curry Secret Service Department had consisted of Shanghai and Moe's, and there were times when the shambling hostler could be much wiser than he looked. It was Shanghai who drew the assignment. Boy, said old man Curry, Johnson has got a colt named Zanzibar that starts next Saturday. I thought I knew all the hosses in training round here, but I've overlooked this one. Find out all you can about him. Yes, Sue, answered Shanghai. Best way to do that would be to bus into a crap game. Miste Johnson got a couple colored swipes what might know something crap shooting fools, both of them, and whiles I'm rolling them bones I could just let a few questions slip out. Yes, Sue, that's good way, but when you ain't shooting your money in the game they just naturally don know you mong them present. If you got couple nice, big, moon-faced dollars to envies, they can't heepy but notice you. They got to do it. Old man Curry smiled and dipped two fingers and a thumb into his vest pocket. Thank you, Sue, chuckled Shanghai, trying hard to appear surprised. Thank you. This Sutney going combine business with pleasure. Get away with you, scolded old man Curry. Now, nearly everyone knows that the Simon Pure feedbox information, the lowdown, and the dead level tip may be picked up behind any barn where hostlers, exercise boys, and apprentice jockeys congregate. Tongues are loosened at such a gathering, and the carefully guarded secrets of trainers and owners are in danger, for the one absorbing topic of conversation is horse, and then more horse. Shanghai knew exactly where to go and departed on his mission whistling jubilantly and chinking two silver dollars in his pocket. At the end of three hours he returned, his ham-like hands thrust deep into empty pockets, and the look in his eye of one who has watched rosy dreams vanish. Where you been all this time, snapped his employer wrathfully. As vinegar to the teeth, and as smoke to the eyes, so is a sluggard to them that send him. I declare, Solomon must have had some black stable boys. What you been at, you trifling hound? Shanghai smiled a sorrowful smile and shook his head. Well, you see, Cunnel, Shanghai always gave his employer a high military rank when in fear of rebuke, you see, Cunnel, it took M longer in usual to break me this morning. I start off right good but I suddenly bowed a tendon and pulled up lame. Once I tossed six passes at them gambles. Never mind that. What did you find out about Zanzibar? Oh, him. Shanghai blinked rapidly as if dispelling a vision. Zanzibar? Why, Cunnel, they I mean to slip him over so today. Ah, ha. Old man Curry tugged at his white beard. Ah, ha. I thought so. 
Had him under cover, eh? Where have they been working him? Out on the county road about two miles fm year. You know that nice stretch with all them trees? Every monin, early, they takes him out. Who takes him out? Lil white boy they calls Dutchy. Nobody else goes with him? Shanghai shook his head. How old is this boy? asked the canny horseman. How old? Why, Cunnel, I reckon he's risin' fifteen, Meb. Smart boy? Shanghai cackled derisively. I loaned him a two-bit piece, Cunnel, and he told me all he knowed. Old man Curry fell to combing his beard, and Shanghai retreated to the tackle room where he found little Mose. The boss, he pullin' his whiskers and cookin' up a job on somebody, remarked the hostler. Huh, grunted Mose. It's time he uz doin' something. Better not leave it all to Solon. The cooking process lasted until evening, by which time old man Curry had ceased to comb his beard and was rolling a straw reflectively from one corner of his mouth to the other. You, Shanghai. Yes, Su. Coming up. Find that little rascal Mose and tell him I want to see him. Yes, Su. And, Shanghai? Yes, Su. I believe I've found the way to rise up. Good news, ejaculated the startled Negro, backing away. But to himself the hostler said, Rise up? Sweet lawn o' liberty. I wonder what bit in the old man now. It was a small and very sleepy exercise boy whom Smiley Johnson tossed into the saddle at four o'clock on Saturday morning, a boy whose teeth were chattering, for he was cold. Canter him the usual distance, Dutchy, said the owner. Then set him down, but not for more than half a mile. Understand? Why yes, sir, stammered the boy, rubbing his eyes with the back of one hand. Don't let him get hot, now. No, sir, I won't. All right. Take him away. Johnson slapped Zanzibar on the shoulder, and the colt moved off in the gloom. His rider, whose other name was Herman Getz, huddled himself in the saddle and reflected on several things, including the hard life of an exercise boy, the perils of the dark, and the hot cup of coffee which he would get on his return. Wrapped in these meditations, he had traveled some distance before he became aware of a dark shape in the road ahead. Coming closer, Kerman saw that it was a horse and rider, evidently waiting for him. Howdy, Jockey Walsh, called a voice. The shortest cut to an exercise boy's heart is to address him as Jockey. Herman's heart warmed toward this stranger, and he drew alongside, trying to make out his features in the darkness. Taint Walsh, said Herman, not without regret. It's Getz. Jockey Getz? I don't seem to place you, Jock. Where you been ridin'? East? I ain't a Jock. I'm only Gallo Pin M. Who are you? Jockey Jones, what rides fall mistake stay curry? If you ain't a jock, you suttony ought to be. You don't set a hawse like no exercise boy. That's why I mistook you fall Walsh. What horse is that? This just one M curry beetles. What you got, jock? Zanzibar. Any good? Well, was the cautious reply, he ain't done anything yet. 
The boys jogged on for some time in silence. You Sutney set him nice and easy, commented Mose. Lee's breeze am a little and see how you handle a haws. Mose booted his mount in the ribs, chore up twice, and the horse broke into a gallop. Herman immediately followed suit, and soon the riders were knee to knee, flying along the lonely road. Shake him up, Jock, urged little Mose. That all you kin get out of him? Shake him up, if you knows how. Of course Herman could not allow anyone to hint that he did not know how. He went out on Zanzibar's neck and shook him up vigorously, a la Todd Sloan in his palmy days. The colt began to draw ahead. From the rear came shrill encouragement. That's what I calls Reg Lou Race Ridin', Jock. Let him out if he got some laugh. Let him out. Carried away by these kind words, Herman forgot his instructions, forgot everything but the thrill of the race. He drove his heels into Zanzibar's sides and crouched low in the saddle. The cold dawn wind cut like a knife. After a time there came a wail from the rear. Nothing to it, Jock. You too good. Too good. Wait for me. Herman drew rein, and soon Mose was alongside again. Canter em a while now, said he. Say, who taught you to ride like that? Nobody, answered Herman modestly. I just picked it up. A natural bound race ride. Sometimes you find em. I wished I could set a hawse down like that. Show me again. It's easy, bragged Herman, and proceeded to demonstrate that statement. Again the compliments floated from the rear, coupled with requests for speed, and yet more speed. Mose was not an apt pupil, however, for he required a third lesson, and at the end of it Zanzibar was blowing heavily. Mose suggested that they turn and go back. If I could get that much out of a hawse, I wouldn't take off my Captain Ojok, said he. W.H. Why ain't you make Johnson give you a mount once in a while? He says I ain't smart enough, was the sulky reply. Little Mose laughed. He just pig-headed, that's all ail him. You like to get a Reg Lou job right and fa good man? Would I? Well, I knows a man what wants a good boy. See that tree yonder? That big one? Lee see who can get there first. It, it's pretty far, ain't it? Shucks. Quota of a mile, Meb. Come on. But it was nearer half a mile, and the three brisk sprints had told on the colt. Budin never so hard, it was all Herman could do to keep Zanzibar on even terms with Moses' mount. You ani foolin' if me. He kin do better than that. We in the stretch now, shake him up. Zanzibar was shaken up for the fourth and last time, shaken up to the limit, and Mose was generous enough to say that the race was a dead heat. As the boys brought the horses to a walk, another negro stepped out from behind a tree, a blanket on his arm. Mose slipped from the saddle and tossed the bridle to Shanghai. Ain't you going to ride back to the track? demanded Herman. No. My boss, he always wants the skate blanketed and led round a while. Sufferin' mackerel, jock. What you go and do with that haws? Shave him? Then for the first time Herman realized that Zanzibar was lathered with sweat, for the first time also he recalled his instructions. I can't take him back like that, he cried. Johnson'll kill me. He told me not to get this horse hot, and look at him. He sucked me some warm, said Shanghai critically. He's steaming like a kettle. What if he is? asked Mose. 
We kin fix that all hunky dory, and Johnson, he won't never know. How can we fix it? Got to let that sweat dry first, warn Shanghai. And then wipe it off, said Mose. It comes off easy when it's dry, supplemented Shanghai as he started down the road with the other horse. Let him stand a while, said Mose. We'll tie him up to this tree. Pity you ain't ridin' some em races Johnson's jock tosses off. Once round that limb's enough. He'll stand. And for rather more than half an hour the good cold Zanzibar shivered in a cold wind while Herman warmed himself in the genial glow of flattering speeches and honeyed compliments. He looks dry now, said Mose at length. We'll rub him down with grass. See how easy it comes off and don't leave no marks neither. Neb you better not say anything to yo boss about this. Say, you don't think I'm a fool, do you? Sutney not. I see yo a pretty wise kid, all right? If I could only get that reglar job you was talking about. It bound to come, Jock, bound to come. You be steering em down at old stretch one of these days, sure. If we just had a little wait, now, we could do a better job on his haws. He's shaking a lot, ain't he? asked Herman. Nuvis, that's all ail him. My side most clean air ready, how you getting along? Smiley Johnson stood at the entrance to his paddock stall shaking hands with acquaintances, slapping his friends on the back, and passing out information. I don't know a great deal about this horse, he would remark confidently. He wasn't much account last season, too nervous and high-strung. I'm only sending him today to see what he'll do, but of course he never figured to beat horses like Blitzen. Not enough class. Curly McManus forced his way into Zanzibar's stall and moved to the far corner where Johnson followed him. Curry is in the betting ring, McManus whispered. Well, what of that? He's betting an awful chunk of dough on Elijah, they're giving him four and five to one. The more he bets, the more he'll lose. But it ain't like him to unbelt for a chunk unless he knows something. Johnson chuckled. Most of his betting is done in books where I've got an interest. Do you think they'd be laying top prices on Elijah if they didn't know something too? I guess that's right, Smiley. You didn't warm this one up today. Why? It would make him too nervous, the crowd, and all. He's fit, is he? Fitter than a snake. We're getting eight and ten to one in the pool rooms all over the coast, and I wish we'd gone even stronger with him. Here comes Curry now. Listen to me kid him. The old man entered the paddock from the betting ring, bound for Elijah's stall. Johnson halted him with a shout. Well, old stick in the mud. You trying today? I'm always trying, answered Curry mildly. My hosses are always trying too. Wish you a lot of luck. Same to you, sir, same to you. But everybody can't win. True as gospel. I found that out right here at this track. Old man Curry continued on his way as calm and untroubled as if his pockets were not loaded down with pasteboards calling for a small fortune in the event of Elijah's winning the race. His instructions to little Mose were brief. Get away in front and stay there. A few moments later Johnson and McManus leaned over the top rail of the fence and watched the horses on their way to the post. That colt of yours looks a little stiff to me, said McManus critically. 
Nonsense. He may be a bit nervous, but he ain't stiff. Well, I hope he ain't. Curry's horse looks good. Later they leveled their field glasses at the starting point. Johnson could see nothing but his own colors, a blazing cherry jacket and cap. McManus spent his time watching Little Mose and Elijah. Smiley, that nigger is playing for a running start. Let him have it. Zanzibar'll be in front in ten jumps. Hennessy knows just how to handle the colt, and he's chain lightning on the break. I suppose the boy on Blitzen'll take care of the nigger if he has to. Slats gave him orders. They're off. Johnson opened his mouth to say something, but the words died away into a choking gurgle. Instead of rushing to the front, the cherry jacket was rapidly dropping back. It was McManus who broke the stunned silence. In front in ten jumps, hey? He's last in ten jumps, that's what he is, stiffer and aboard. And look where Curry's nigger is, will you? To hell with Curry's nigger, barked Johnson. Look at the colt. He, he can't untrack himself, runs like he was all bound up somehow. Something has gone wrong, sure. You bet it has, snarled McManus. Quite a pile of dough has gone wrong, and some of it was mine too. A comfortable ten lengths to the good at the upper turn, Little Mose addressed a few vigorous remarks to his mount. This a nice place for us to stay, Legia. Them Irish boys all be in us. Nobody go and bump you today. Nobody go and slash you with no whip. Go on, big red haws. Show em how we risen up. The nigger'll win in a romp, announced McManus disgustedly. Oh, dry up. I want to know what's happened to Zanzibar. I can tell you what's going to happen to him, remarked the unfeeling McManus. He's going to finish last, and a damn bad last at that. Why, he can't get up a gallop. Didn't you know any more than to start a horse in that condition? But how the devil did he get stiff all at once, howled Johnson. That's what you'd better find out. How do we know you didn't cross us, Johnson? It would be just like you. Old man Curry, watching at the paddock gate, thrust his hands under the tails of his rusty frock coat and smiled. A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, he quoted softly. And the wicked, well, they'll have a mighty lame hoss on their hands, I reckon. Mose began checking Elijah, several lengths in front of the wire. Don't go bustin' alone, Hawes, said he. Might need it again. You win neen by a mile. A a a mile. Solomon was right, but maybe he wouldn't have been if I hadn't done some risin' up myself this morning. Whoa, Hawes. This where they pay off. We tho for the day. Old man Curry was striding down the track from the judge's stand when he met a large man whose face was purple and his language purple also. Man, don't talk like that, said Curry reprovingly. And C.A.M. down or you'll bust an artery. You can't win all the time, that's what you told me. Johnson sputtered like a damp Roman candle, but a portion of his remarks were intelligible. Oh, Zanzibar, said old man Curry. He's a right nice colt. He ought to be. He pretty nigh run the legs off my Alicia this morning, but... Wah, what's that? Yes, continued old man Curry, they had it back and forth up that road, hot and heavy. I expect maybe Zanzibar got a chill from sweating so hard. Out of the whirl of Mr. Johnson's remarks and statements of intention Curry selected one. No, said he, 
I reckon you won't beat that German kid to death. He didn't know any better. You won't lay a finger on him, because why? He's on a railroad train by now, going home to Cincinnati. I reckoned his mother might like to see him. And you ain't going to make no trouble for me, Johnson. Not a mite. You might whip a little kid, you big, bulldozing windbag, but I reckon you won't stand up to a man, no matter how old he is. I, I'll have your entries refused. Don't go to no such trouble as that, was the soothing reply. There won't be no more curry entries at this track. A just man might fall down seven times again in such a nest of thieves and robbers. Tell that to your judges, and be damned. And, head erect, shoulders squared, and eyes flashing, old man Curry started for the betting ring to collect his due.